All right. Uh, thank you, Gita, a lot for the uh, introduction. And this is going to be a very, very short summary about a couple special projects that I'm working on over at the MGH. Um, it's going to be a top-level overview. Um, if you have any questions, please ask me during or uh, after the talk. I really try to use a lot of pictures, so I'm trying not to go into you know any of the theory or use any jargon, but if I slip into it, you know, raise your hand and let me know. So um, I want to say that you know all the projects that I'm going to be talking about um, are a result of a team effort. There's a big group over at MGH who I collaborate with. And given that my project is about infant brain development, I have very strong ties to the Boston Children's Hospital as well. And over the years, I have hosted several postdocs and students also, whose work is also very essential. <coughs> I'm going to mention that a lot of the projects that I'm working on in the research phase are short-term or long-term. Uh, we'll be part of uh, a, free surf uh, a tool that's called FreeSurfer. It's an algorithmic computational tool environment where most of my lab, lab's code eventually ends up. This is a huge team effort, and here you see some of the postdocs, junior faculty members who are working on it. And let me start introducing some of these projects. So what is FreeSurfer? It's uh, a freely available and op open source neuroimaging uh, software. Um, among other things, uh, the key things that it achieves, or the reason why people use it, is to get detailed information about cortical and subcortical areas. So it gives you quantitative um, description uh, of the brain if you present the, the software with an MRI image. So think about a very simple MRI structural scan of the brain and it's going to spit out some numbers and location for certain anatomical structures. It also contains some statistical tools. So if you have more than one subject and you want to con com compare a normal healthy population with a disease group, uh, you can also do that. And besides the regular structural MR images, we also have tools um, to process functional images, so more complex sort of 4D images, like functional MRI images, diffusion-weighted images, and also um, PET images as well. Um, given that it's an open source software, we have um, an increasing number of users. Uh, we give local and international courses all the time. So um, luckily our user base is increasing, which is very, very encouraging. Just to give you a little bit more of an example of what do I mean by characterizing the brain? This is one way of thinking about it. So um, given an MR image as an input, uh, what you get is basically a colored brain. You can think about you know, finding different tissue types, uh, assigning different numbers of different colors uh, to these brain areas. And this is completely automatically done so that when you are trying to um, characterize, for example, a disease or understand what a particular um, drug um, during a drug trial is doing to the brain, you, you have some numbers. You can squeeze out something, some information about certain areas or discover um, new areas that might be impacted uh, by those. Excuse me. Yes. Do you have some kind of common coordinate system in which to put the images from different <coughs> subjects? Yes. So I didn't want to go into that, but I'm really happy to talk about it because this is one of my special uh, interests. So when you are individual and al analyzing a brain, for example, you know, we have the input image, so one individual's brain scan, we get all this kind of coloring. But uh, we can imagine if I, if I analyze 100 of these brains and I want to say something about the location or the size of the caudate or the shape of it, somehow I need to find a reference system where I find the corresponding points in all of these uh, brain images. So that's called the registration problem in our field. And we have lots of different types of common coordinate spaces in, we, in which we can do this analysis. For our software, we have our own. We have a volumetric and a surface-based um, atlas. And I'm going to show you in the next slide why we differentiate between the volumetric and the surface-based representation. But we also provide you with tools in order to re relate your fi findings or this coordinate space 
with some of the ones that are very commonly used in neuroscience. For example, if you are familiar with it, then the MNI or the Telerep coordinate system are the ones that are regularly cited if you are reading the literature. So, uh, does this answer the question? Yeah, yeah. okay. So I mentioned that besides the, these volumetric labels, we are also very interested in cortical surfaces. And why is that? Uh, I think the upcoming two images show it to you, um, or illustrate it very well. So here I just show you the um, organization of the visual areas of a monkey. And you can see that it's, even though it's, it's, it's a drawing, but it's an illustration of how these areas cluster together and how you can find the different structure, neighboring structures. And I can also show you um, the human visual areas that were mapped using uh, a technique called retinotopy. And what I want you to focus on is on the left-hand side, uh, you see a flattened uh, version of the cortex. So basically think about the gray matter basically peeled away and then flattened uh, on the surface. Some mathematical operations go into it, but you can see that um, the organization of these visual areas is very clear. You see some pattern, you see contiguous areas. It's not noisy or it's not, um, it's very well defined. However, the same information that you see on the left hand side is presented here in the, on the right hand side with three orthogonal views in the volume. So you see that here, even though I'm coloring the same areas and showing you exactly the same information, it's not very intuitive how to put together these contiguous areas and how they are related to each other. So given that the pattern you know, that we are trying to describe and that are going to be very important for different functional studies when you are trying to understand what areas of the brain are working or lighting up given certain tasks, we, we have special tools in order to do the analysis and the computations uh, on the surface. And in order to do that and visualize the results, um, after we extract these boundaries, so we have two boundaries that uh, I'm going to be mentioning today, the white matter surface or the boundary between the gray matter and white matter, and the PL surface, which is between the gray matter and the CSF, the cortical spinal fl fluid. So you see the representation of these two surfaces uh, in 3D here. And um, depending on what kind of study we do or where we want to represent our results, we are going to be using um, these uh, very commonly in order to make things more intuitive and more visually um, approachable for the researchers. And <coughs> if we have access to these surfaces, then we can start coloring or outlining boundaries of different anatomical areas, not only in the volume, but also on the surface. So here, for example, you see some of the gyro patterns um, outlined. Now, this is all nice, and you know, I can tell you that FreeSurfer has been used for almost 10 years analyzing these brains. So um, why did I start you know, the introduction with that, and where are the babies you know, that you know, the, I announced that you know, I'm really interested in analyzing? So here's, here's an example of a set of uh, infant uh, baby brain acquisitions. So these are all coronal views. And what I want to point out <coughs> is that even though in the literature and even in our own lab, we have plenty of tools you know, written over the years that have been able to analyze adult or you know, starting from usually mm, teens, teenagers, and then uh, older adults, these tools are working perfectly fine. However, these uh, newborns, up until the age of maybe two or three, these tools all fail because the anatomy that, um, that we are imaging in case of infants is very, very different. So there's a couple of key, com key uh, features that I would like to um, draw your attention to. So first of all, um, you see, so I, I ordered these acquisitions um, with respect to age. So on the top left side, you see uh, a newborn that was imaged in the first uh, day of life. And in, in the bottom right, uh, it's a two-year-old, uh, an image of a two-year-old uh, infant. So you see that um, already during that period, there's a huge scale change uh, in between the brain. I mean, if you've ever seen a baby growing up, you know, there's a huge, uh, um, head size difference between you know uh, when they were born and around age one and one and a half 
And another very in interesting phenomenon, which is um, going to make the automated processing or the computational tools life very difficult, is something which we call the which we call a contrast flip. So, if I point it out here, so this is the gray matter here, and this is uh, uh, white matter and gray matter. So you see sort of the squiggly cortical ribbon is a dark gray color, and then the white matter that basically provides connections in between different areas in the gray matter are lighter color, lighter intensity gray. However, that's exactly the inverse in the, uh, in the newborn cases. So there, the cortical ribbon is the lighter color, and the white matter is darker. So this is going to be a problem for us in a sense that we can't really use sort of a, um, a standard three-dimensional reference frame or reference to how these tissue types are represent, represented in MRI images. So what we need is that... So hmm? do you know or do we know why is it happening? Yes. So, so this is a process called myelination. Uh -huh. So in the white matter there are fibers and I'm going to show you images about that they are getting myelinated or insulated, basically, uh, to create more stable and better connections. And these are still finalizing, getting finalized mm -hmm. after birth. And so the flip happens around, you know, between five and seven months of life. It also depends on what kind of MRI you use for the imaging, so where it shows up on the images. But when that stabilizes, when this myelination process stabilizes, then you get the same contrast or the same type of behavior that you would see in case of adult scans. Before you see the flip version. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, all that is to say is that we need to use more complex models in order to be able to write tools that are going to automatically uh, analyze these images and include that knowledge about sort of this time dependency when we are trying to, um, you know, analyze our images. So very quickly, the challenges that we face when we have these um, pediatric uh, brain images is the size size difference. So here, uh, I found this chart that shows very well that in the first two years of life, um, we have double or sometimes two and a half times uh, size difference um, in the brain size. So we definitely, any algorithm that's going to be used for analyzing uh, baby brain images needs to uh, accommodate that. Then we have the MR contrast change due to this process called the myelination. And as you can imagine, recruitment is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. While for an adult, I can tell them, <coughs> okay, I give you 20 bucks, 30 bucks, or I give you a CD, you know, with your MR images, and you know, you can find people who are going to be willing to lie in the scanner for, uh, for uh, an hour, for example. Uh, it's much more difficult to recruit parents with newborns, you know, in order to come back to the hospital, especially if their babies have no other, you know, health reasons to return to the hospital. If they do need to stay in the clinic, then we are restricted by, you know, whatever their treatment requires. <coughs> A couple of times we need to be satisfied with whatever clinical scan they get for their treatment or other times we can sort of add a two or three minutes very, very fast scan for research purposes, depending on you know, the severity of their cases. But definitely numbers are low, and you need to be much, much better organized with collaborators in order to get enough numbers so that you can have a statistically sound study. And then, even if you recruited the subject, the scanning is quite uh, challenging. Uh, the infants, uh, are supposedly sleeping during the, the scans. So we try to, uh, for the healthy controls, we try to feed them and swallow them and then wait for them to, to fall asleep. And then we just hope that they don't wake up, you know, while the machine is working. If they do, we pull them out and that's it. So you might lose, you know, the whole scanning. Mm -hmm. It is a very noisy machine. So do you use yeah. some earplugs yeah. or, or what do you use for anesthesia? Uh, Any anesthesia because it not for the healthy it. controls. Uh, anesthesia is only used if it's clinically required uh, because you need a license for that. So it's only medical collaborators and it's done, we do it in a very small percentage of the cases. Okay. The babies are not moving? The babies, they're not moving if, well, we are, they're not well. moving if they're sleeping. So that's why we are trying to, if we have a chance, try to match their sleeping cycle. Mm -hmm. The moms are usually, you know, coming with them to the scanner room. 
this is all, you know, when it's a controlled case for the healthy controls. For the clinical cases, whatever you can do, <laughs> or whatever is, you know, needed for the scan is going to be done. Um, but yes, motion is a huge problem because as soon as uh, babies wake up, or even, you know, during their sleep, sometimes they suck on their thumbs, um, that destroys the scan. So again, we need to pull them out. We have certain strategies how to deal with motion while the scanning is running, so we can start reacquiring re smartly the scans, so we don't need to wait for the scan, analyze it, and then put them back into the scanner. But some of the motion is just too severe, and uh, we, you know, we have to throw those away. So it's, it's a very challenging process, so uh, the numbers compared to adult studies are still pretty small. It's something that a lot of universities started working on, well not a lot, but more and more universities are starting to focus on, so hopefully in a couple of years it's going to be much higher numbers. So my particular interest is um, algorithmic development. So I have a computer science background, at, and what I'm interested in is writing algorithms and tools in order to process uh, these data sets to come up with some quantitative measures describing either one particular case, a whole population, a process which is time dependent. And in this particular scen scenario, the requirements for these tools are, you know, they need to be automated because uh, the more manual editing is needed in a process, uh, the more time consuming it is, and it's becoming very biased and very subjective. We know that even though we use sort of manual annotations as a golden standard in a lot of validation studies, um, each uh, labeler or each expert is very biased, and even from day one to day two, they can um, annotate or give their answer sort of a, with a very high variability. So we really try to sort of um, get rid of the uh, manual component of any of our software tools. It has to be robust. As I mentioned, you know, we have a lot of images that are not ideal, especially given this population. So we try to write tools that are able to accommodate um, less than uh, super high quality uh, images. And it has to be accurate for the particular purpose that we are going to be using it for. It has to be reasonably fast. I, you know, I put the asterisk there because we are not working in a surgical environment. You know, the answer doesn't need to be ready right away. You know, it should be ready within a reasonable amount of time, but that's, you know, a real-time sort of computation at this point is not truly a requirement. And the output is usually, as I mentioned, a quantitative measure, you know, thickness measure, curvature measurement, area, surface, uh, something that, you know, can characterize the particular phenomenon that you are interested in. And a couple of computational tools for which I'm going to show you examples for are the following. I'm going to show you examples for skull stripping, and I'm going to tell you what that tool is. But the magic word prior guided, what that means is um, we are going to write tools, or we are interested in using tools that learn from a training data set. So that training data set is going to be very carefully analyzed, it's going to be manually annotated, or additional information is going to be added to it. And we are going to create this atlas, or this summary from our training data set. And we are going to use that information combined with the test data sets, so the new images information, combine the two and come up with the solution um, for our question. So there's this, the, the same type of method, this prior guided uh, method is used for the annotation, finding cortical and subcortical uh, labels, and for surface extraction. I already mentioned to you how useful it, was, it is for us to have access to these, this surface representation in case of adults, so we definitely need those in case of the infants as well. Now, I showed you the images that uh, sort of represented the great variability in between the intensity scans and the sizes of these uh, infant uh, brain scans. So what we did is, four years ago, we started to manually annotate these. This is a very painful process. It takes around two weeks for one person to fully man uh, manually annotate these uh, MRI scans. And that's after a lot of learning and training. So um, there's only one label that's missing from some of the scans, and that's um, the gray-white boundary. And that is because we are still, so this is still a data set that we are enriching, but these labels only appear where we are pretty certain that we can establish this boundary. 
Otherwise, the myelination process or some noise um, give us images that you know, we are fairly uncertain about you know, this location. So we don't want to use that as sort of a golden validation data set uh, if that is the case. So our algorithm is going to be learning from these data sets and is going to um, you know, benefit from the new information and come up with the output. One other thing before I go to the individual tools is that our strategy is, um, was to, to spread out the samples as much as possible in the uh, age range of interest. So as you can see here, I have um, 0 to 19 uh, month old sort of, uh, age time points. And instead of sort of uh, congregating or sampling our uh, data sets that is commonly done around newborns, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, we wanted to sample and represent uh, data sets from all different ages. Given that we have clinical collaborators and we cannot really control what kind of subjects and, uh, and what, sub uh, what subjects and of what age they are going to be recruiting um, in their setting. Segmentation results, I told you that surface extraction is also a very important problem. So the first initialization is going to be just basically looking at the boundaries that are outlined uh, by these segmentations, and then picking sort of surfaces and making sure that these surfaces um, are topologically correct. So there's no holes or no, um, no errors on the surface um, of these representations. And let me show you an example of why this could be interesting. So I showed you an example of why it makes sense to extract these surfaces, why it is important or interesting for neuroscientists to have access to this kind of representation. But maybe, maybe this example is going to um, <coughs> sort of represent that very well. Uh, as I mentioned, getting access to pediatric data is very, very difficult. Getting access to serial or longitudinal data is even harder. Because then you need to convince the parents multiple times to come back to the hospital and get you know, the brain scans done. And even if you can convince them, the dropout rate is quite high. So um, it, it's an even more challenging problem. But you know, there's a lot of resources sort of put towards that, given that a lot of very useful information could be recovered um, using um, such processing. So here I have a subject who was imaged at 29 uh, days of age. And I did my processing, so I extracted the labels and the surfaces from the MRI scan. And here's the uh, time point two scan, which was taken at 91 days. So if I flip back and forth again, you can appreciate just the size uh, change within these uh, three months. And um, as I said, after I do the segmentation, I can extract these surfaces uh, from, um, from these cases. Now I can compare these surfaces uh, between these two time points. Uh, here the left hand side, sorry, is the PL surface and the right hand side the bottom here is the white matter surface. Again, this is the younger one, this is the older one. Um, just to show you visually why it could be interesting or why it is interesting you know, to have access to such a representation, I think this movie is going to be very interesting. So if you follow the timeline, it starts at a negative number. That's possible because we have some preemies, uh, access to some prematurely born uh, infants. And the video, what, is, uh, what the video is trying to show you is how the brain is developing or how certain gyral patterns are still forming after birth. Now, uh, a note here, this particular movie was created by cross-sectional data. What I mean is that we had access to MRI images from lots of different subjects, and just like the question you know, came, uh, we put them into the same coordinate space, extracted their surfaces, and created this movie outlining how, if I make this change dependent on the time, how that would look like. Sort of imitating what would happen or how the brain is changing as the infant is getting older. Now definitely, besides the time change here in the, in the video, I also have a lot of contribution from intersubject differences. So a lot of the changes that we see are not necessarily due to time, but because you know, different individuals have different types of patterns, different uh, cortical patterns develop slightly at a different age. So that longitudinal example that I gave you before would be really useful if we had a numerous of these uh, several time point acquisitions. We could put together a movie and understand much better 
what is a normal variation when we have uh, normal growth, and how can we set biomarkers for, let's say, prematurely born uh, kids or kids that are born with congenital heart disease or who have some neuronal uh, sort of developmental delays and see how different and in which areas the development is different in their cases. Um, very quickly, I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about another modality that's still MRI, uh, but it's diffusion-weighted MRI. Uh, if I want to characterize it, it's going to give us more information about tractography or white matter components. So these are the tracts, these are the fibers that are connecting functional areas in the gray matter. So um, if we identify these tracts and we can characterize them, uh, this is going to give us information about how well connected or how not well connected uh, the different brain regions are. And it can give us some clues uh, to the understanding of certain diseases, aging, uh, and development. Now, the, the quantity diffusion, uh, what does it describe in case of diffusion weighted MRI? Uh, it differentiates different, uh, the different tissue types based upon how the water molecules uh, are moving or are allowed to move uh, within the tissue. So very simple example, if you have the gray matter, uh, the diffusion is unrestricted there. What that means is at any time point, the water molecule can basically diffuse in any direction with the same probability. If you are in the white matter, as I mentioned, you have these uh, fibers or these tubular structures so just like in a case of a straw, for example, um, the water is restricted. There's going to be only certain limited directions in which the water molecules can uh, flow. And it's not going to be sort of you know, moving uh, across these boundaries. So these are, this is the information that we are going to be grabbing and uh, displaying in case of these diffusion weighted images. So this, uh, this image, I think, illustrates very well uh, how we can manually uh, outline some of the well-known uh, white matter fiber tracts in case of a prematurely uh, born infant. So what we did is we reconstructed well, all possible fiber tracts and all is really in quotation marks here because it's given the, uh, the quality of the scan and the resolution of the scan that we got provided with. And uh, manually, using our uh, tool, assigned a label to each of these tracts that belongs to a particular anatomy, and in this case, it's a, it's a fiber tract. Now, uh, this, this slide just shows you the different steps. Maybe it helps you understand how, how we did that. The tool that we use is Checklist. It's, it's part of our um, software environment. Again, it's freely available and downloadable, so anybody can play with it. Um, what happens on the left hand side, you reconstruct all possible connections in the brain, that's uh, the information that's provided by your data. And then you start putting down these uh, regions of interest or uh, areas where you know anatomically, from anatomical knowledge, that these tracks that you are interested in should be crossing through. And then you put in another uh, area where you, know, you also know that these tracks should be going through. And at the end of the day, you, you are left with the, fi the, the fiber tracks that um, you know, connect these two uh, areas. And sometimes you need to do some cleaning if you had lots of noise in your data set. But depending on how accurately ca you can put these regions of interest, this is how you would do the manual labeling of your uh, images. So this is a quick summary. Uh, I told you about um, our software environment tool that I'm working on enriching with these uh, tools that are going to be particularly designed for uh, infant brain images, particularly in the zero to two year age range. I told you a little bit about structural MRI analysis and also included some multimodal uh, image analysis example using diffusion weighted MRI images. And thank you for your attention and please ask me lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs>
it's well, it's uh, I'm not a doctor. But <laughs> it's basically the structures are growing, so it's new cells that are being sort of generated, and the folding pattern is getting more and more convoluted. So, as far as you know, it's getting more and more complex. If you if you look at the folding pattern also, so as the body is growing, it, the the brain is also growing. The interesting thing about the brain is that during these two years the change is almost twice or triple, but then it kind of slows down and plateaus out, while the body, you know, I mean, they keep going, and so, but in case of the brain, it's a very specific and targeted process that, that we need to pay attention to when we are writing these automated tools. Just back to this previous yeah. question, I don't know if others are here. Gabor, you think it's growing? There are stem cells and the brain is still growing? I, I know in the cerebellum, there's a, there's a lot of more giants who suffer birth. I don't mm -hmm. know what so probably the, the, the numbers are still growing. Mm -hmm. Yes? You are already pushing the boundary, obviously, <laughs> moving from uh, adults to newborns. Mm -hmm. I speculate that as a scientist, it occurred to you already that what about pushing even further mm -hmm. and moving from newborn to intra-uteri? My first mm -hmm. quick question is that, that is, would that be feasible, is that feasible? based on present day technology, scanning capabilities, how fast, how slow, and, and, and the computer capabilities. And my second question is that what do you think such a non-invasive intrauterine methodology could be, would be, might be potentially helpful in, in, the, in, in these potentially devastating cases when, when the, when the uh, younger uh, would be mother is uh, infected by the Zika. Very interesting questions. So um, the good news is that it is possible. So at the Children's Hospital there, uh, and probably several other locations around the country, they are already acquiring um, fetal MRI scans. Um, as you can imagine, it's even more, <laughs> more difficult and more complex, <laughs> even just from the acquisition side. Um, the fetus is constantly moving, uh, so there are special type of acquisitions that they use for this problem. Basically, um, the, the scans are acquired slice by slice in three orthogonal directions, and there's a lot more post-processing that needs to be done in order to uh, basically compute a contiguous and smooth-looking 3D volume that represents that brain. But it's, uh, I mean, in, it, it's. It's been done on a fairly standard manner right now. I mean, you know, I, I, I wouldn't say that everybody can do it. Who is the youngest, uh, I mean, during the pregnancy? I so know cool. that some of our collaborators already acquired around 19, 20 weeks. Um, I don't know about anything younger, but, you know, don't quote mm -hmm. me on that. Maybe, yeah, maybe uh, earlier. I know that Dr. Ellen Ryan, mm -hmm. there is, uh, she has some mates for 18 weeks. Mm -hmm. I think it's the youngest that she has. So Naira is working with the investigator in the Children's mm -hmm. Hospital who uh, I also collaborate with. So yeah, 18, 19 weeks, you know, these are the numbers I heard. Uh, I don't know about any younger ones, but um, yeah. Uh, and uh, going back to the Zika virus, that's very interesting uh, that you ask because we uh, actually have some active collaboration in Brazil and we are trying to figure out whether we, what kind of, um, collaboration we could have with them. We have the knowledge about how to acquire the sequences and we have sort of the post-processing experience, uh, but obviously we don't have the patient group and uh, sort of, you know, we are in, in the process of trying to coordinate any such effort if they need any of our help. Um, it's definitely a very interesting problem and I think the sooner we, can, we could get access to um, this patient group, uh, the better. Uh, they are already recruiting in certain key centers pregnant women who are um, who are infected by Zika. Um, now I imagine there's a lot of local groups are they already doing a lot of studies on them. Um, so it's in the development, but we would really like to uh, partake in that. Yeah. 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 Would you please go back to the slide prior to the bar graph? Prior to the bar graph, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that these are ordered by age. Yes. Uh huh. So these are segmented. My mm -hmm. question is, why is the middle of the so the first row, the middle one is 
similar to the oldest one? So these four are all newborns. It's a very good question. These four are all newborns, and in one case, uh, so the distinction is tricky because here, in case of the newborn, we have unmyelinated white matter and gray matter. So the border here is not between myelinated, fully, vi fully myelinated white matter and gray matter, but the image acquisition quality was so good that we actually labeled these boundaries. Uh, in order to guide us to sort of to understand, you know, where this boundary is. In case of the others, uh, you know, the segmenters didn't have the um, the competence in order to draw those boundaries. So that's why you have that one representation there. It's it's definitely needs to be you know carefully interpreted because the two labels are not uh, definitely equivalent across the age group. But very good observation. <laughs> Yes. Excuse me, I mean, just answering this how yeah. many brain cells. Yeah. We are born with 100 billion nerve cells mm -hmm. in our brain, and uh, uh, they don't uh, replicate, and except for some regions of the, of the brain, the cerebellum, olfactory bulb, prefrontal from the cortex, and the hippocampus. And mm -hmm. only in the hippocampus, uh, there are uh, new uh, cells uh, regenerated, mm -hmm. and that's uh, connected with the memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. We have some researchers here who are working with brain stem cells, so maybe next time we will have a presentation <laughs> about that one. Yes. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yes? Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I just want to go this, this line of talk that uh, we're dealing with the baby boomers generation and uh, <laughs> the two ends of that the uh -huh. babies and the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. The elderly who are losing their speech production capacity. Mm -hmm. So way too often I see my hospital um, uh, and carry out the catalyst uh, the dementia problem. So it's so common, it's so striking to see that, that, that just generally everybody is moving and learn the English language mm -hmm. where it came from. Mm -hmm. uh, country like this country uh, my area is many Portuguese speakers, so uh, we have to hire Portuguese native Portuguese speakers, nurses. citizens patients who are unable to speak any longer because uh, you know, my colleague who had a long flight to the Philippines, he became a phagic, uh, got a stroke in the mm -hmm. air, um, <coughs> uh, broke up all the form, which is a speech production area. And it's so striking and so amazing that <coughs> you have to live over the language, the English one, with a story different than the primary language. Mm -hmm. So it's a common benefit actually. <coughs> in the hospital setting, the uh, speech therapy, it's, a, it's an American concept. It doesn't really exist in, at least not in Europe, which I'm there. So this Filipino doctor was so incapacitated, I had to cover for him. And we could do it with my unit, maybe others. He was able to gain back his English language, and now his product will be working again after 12 months of therapy. Mm -hmm. Not being in the US, probably he would be talking just like a four year old mm -hmm. uh, because we have a stroke in that area. So <coughs> that's another enormous implication, tremendous implication of the research. Mm -hmm. Other babies which are 70 and older, my youngest <laughs> mother, uh, the son of my he was, was actually 48 years old. So he even recognized who had a connection with her name. So that's definitely <laughs> related and um, you know, it's also well known that sort of the reorganization of these functional areas is much easier the younger you are. So a lot of times that's why we want to find early biomarkers that say, if we could detect, let's say, in case of prematurely born population, that some of them belong to, you know, a group where, you know, they're going to naturally catch up with this neurodevelopmental delay, we could do targeted therapy and we could try to see whether there's anything that can be done in order to, you know, precipitate that process. If we don't do that, you know, it's going to, we are only going to rec recognize that around the age of three, four, you know, when they should be you know, speaking and interacting and doing certain tasks. So again, early detection, that's kind of the, the goal, you know, in this area. Mm -hmm. So that question, you mentioned dementia, and I was just wondering when, when that occurs, mm -hmm. is it similar to this process, but the other way? <laughs> or, uh, the process is... Check it out. Play back, play back. 
Yeah. There's a like, lot of. I mean, is, it, is there a logic to that? Or? There's a lot of complex processes going on, and you know, there's a lot of ongoing research. Uh, one very visually striking difference, even with normal aging, is that the cortical areas are thinning. So that's why cortical thickness is a very is a key measurement, and then a lot of population studies, if you know, people are dealing with aging or sort of certain types of dementia, then this is one of the first quantitative measures that they want to sort of display, compare among their populations. And then you can localize that, see you know, which areas are losing or thinning first. Um, but beyond that, there's a lot of other you know, sort of more tissue related uh, changes that you know, take place and can describe that. The constant studying doesn't help you. Sorry? Make, make the, the thickness thicker. Constant studying. Oh, constant studying. Um, you know, there's always a couple of posters <laughs> that, that claim that, you know, you can increase it, but, uh, yeah. But I'm not sure there's a conclusive study of that. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, yeah. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just go ahead. Uh, I know. Okay. So, uh, do you, I don't know if, how long do you have on mm -hmm. the patients, but did you have any of the patients that you already analyzed diagnosed with autism? And if you have, have you um, looked at any morphological differences compared to the controls? So I haven't looked at any uh, autistic uh, subjects yet, but our collaborators at MIT and the, at the Children's are really interested in recruiting that, those patients. And as you said, usually these uh, subjects get recruited much later. So what we are working on right now, we, by setting up these longitudinal studies, we are trying to sort of combine efforts and have you know overlapping data sets, and you know including in the imaging study any clinical follow-up you know that's going to be sort of helpful referencing back to the newborn uh, status as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so what's the resolution of these images? Um, and what is the trend of resolution? So for these newborns, uh, this is uh, sort of these clinical research uh, scans for the structural ones are one by one by one isotropic. And for the diffusion scans, they are two by two by two. Um, clinically, usually, um, or even for research purposes, you don't really have too much more time to go to higher resolution. Um, so I would say this is kind of a higher, higher standard. There's definitely cases where, uh, especially for radiological reading, uh, people prefer higher in-plane resolution. So you can push it down to 0.75, for example, 0 0.75, 0 0.75, but then the slice thickness is going to be, let's say, three millimeters. So just think about you know higher resolution in one plane, but you are going to be jumping you know much larger steps. Uh, so all these Yes. Mm -hmm. And what is the trend? Is it getting more detailed? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, our physicists, so we have, you know, our group has two main, you know, sort of subgroups. One are physicists who are pushing and improving the sequences, and then the other group is the post processing. So if you have a, a sequence already acquired, what can I do with it? The physicists are always trying to make, you know, the, the scanners run faster. Um, you know, less, n not as noisy as uh, they do right now, uh, higher, um, uh, higher resolution. But, you know, it really depends on what you want to use these scans for, because for engineers, we would say, you know, higher resolution scans, definitely much better. Radiologists don't like that, you know, they train on a particular resolution. Anything extra is, you know, sort of, um, you know, adding, let's say, eight times, you know, like increasing twice uh, the resolution increases eight times the, the size of data that they need to go through. They have an allocated amount of time that they need to get through all the data sets. Plus, a higher resolution scan is going to show you newer and newer structures that they need to train in order to understand what they are. So, you know, there's a push and pull in how much, you know, we can actually feed them and how much they actually are capable of analyzing and how much they need for certain diagnostic purposes. So, you know, we are definitely pushing on one side, but, um, you know, it also depends on for what purposes you are using the, the scanner for. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> you, you don't feel sorry for the results? Or? I said that I feel sorry about Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>
Uh, we really appreciate, Lila, that you actually uh, accepted this invitation in such oh, a short yeah, notice as well. Yeah. So thank you so much again. And I just want to encourage everybody to ask uh, questions probably later as well from um, Lila. Yes. But now we would like to move on. And actually, this whole side, yes. <laughs> Thank you.